right. Welcome everybody, thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Tim Mushin, I'm the CEO of Clock Tower Media. Uh, this is Jordan Doucette, Jordan's the Director of Business Development. And we also have uh, James Lee in the back, taking a picture for everybody back at the office. Yeah. <laughs> Please say hi to James. Uh, James is the Director of Development. Um, Clock Tower Media is a digital agency we build websites and work with companies uh, ranging in all sorts of sizes. And we do different projects. We do a lot of reporting projects, we do a lot of design projects, um, and we do a lot of work with uh, APIs and systems in the back. Um, Jordan, do you want to talk a little bit more? Sure. Yeah. So, uh, let's advance this on here. All right. So, yeah, when Tim started the company back in 1999 and uh, went through the dot com boom and the dot com bust and uh, was able to continue the company and, and we've grown and, and done all kinds of great things. So one project uh, that is in particular that we worked on was uh, most recently for the University of Idaho. Worked with one of their departments there called EBSCOR. It's a biomedical research department, it's grant funded. Uh, we essentially uh, took what they had and been doing by hand, which was filling out reports on grant activities and things like that, and uh, created a web-based application uh, that allows all of their students and faculty and different levels of leadership uh, to enter information on the web and then uh, have that information feed up through aggregate forms and things like that and then uh, pull all into a reporting system that's in one location. So um, filters like date range, the uh, grant that the information was reported on, uh, user types, report types and specific data from each individual form uh, is something that they can pull in. Uh, so in their very first year of uh, having the system in place, they're able to do everything that would have taken them weeks and weeks in about 25% of that time. So as we move into what we'll be covering today, uh, we really want to talk about the road to Web 3.0, give you a brief overview of what Web 1.0 was, how that transitioned into Web 2.0, and then ultimately, uh, this newer concept of Web 3.0 and what that means. Uh, we're also going to talk about how we relate Web 3.0 and some of those concepts into the design of your reporting systems or into websites or uh, however you might use it. Um, and then finally, we'll talk about the technologies and strategies and different tools that we like to use when implementing these Web 3.0 um, elements. So to start, we wanted to talk about Web 1.0 and the definition of Web 1.0, which really, you, it's difficult to define because at the time, that's all there ever was. There wasn't a Web 0.5, uh, there was a Web 1.0, and so essentially Web 1.0 consisted of everything before Web 2.0. So basically anything before 2005, 2006, when you started seeing some of those new fresh designs and some of those easy user interfaces, is what we would consider 1.0. It was really, uh, mostly static information where you might have someone's personal website that they used uh, some application to build but once they put the information up it, it really stayed the same uh, there wasn't a whole lot to keep the user coming back to the website uh, and so uh, it was really it didn't have any any features like social sharing or comments or feedback or anything like that it was here's my information and uh, do, it, do with it what you would like. And so moving into, into the next uh, concept of Web 1.0 is this idea of the web is kind of like a library for information. So you can have uh, all of your information categorized and, and put into different areas. And there are some search functions, but they're pretty elementary. So you know this is probably the best way at the time to find the information. Here's a, a screenshot that uh, is from the old Yahoo website, which was really kind of the authority at the time on uh, information, how you can find it. And then we also wanted to talk about web app or software applications. So instead of something that's highly dynamic, a lot of times people were using a software application that couldn't be changed to build their website. So something like GeoCities. And this is an example of what maybe a web 1.0 dashboard for a reporting system may have looked like um, uh, earlier in the web. And uh, just something to uh, consider as we move through our presentation here. So moving into web 2.0, uh, the main focus was let's simplify this design. Let's make it easier for people to use. 
let's get away from this concept of this library where I have to search through all this information to find just what I want, and let's move into something very simple. And this is where you see the rise of, of uh, things like Google come into play where they introduced a web page that is highly different from what you would see in uh, a Yahoo type of web page. And so uh, design simplification was, was a big deal. Um, now, Web 2.0 was also where you saw the introduction of uh, dynamic content. So instead of personal websites, you had blogs with syndication and, and reasons for people to come back because, uh, because the information was, was being updated on a regular basis and, and, and people actually had some great things to say and, and they wanted to say it a lot. <laughs> um, and then you had the introduction, introduction of communities like Twitter and Facebook where instead of the top-down approach for the web, you really saw that bottom-up approach where people were starting to drive what the web included. It, it wasn't as much just the, just the authors or the publishers. Um, you also see systems like Yelp come out uh, and, and City Search, where you have feedback and reviews that, that are becoming increasingly popular. And, and all of this is kind of setting the stage for, for where Web 3.0 is going to go. Um, and then you obviously you have sharing as well. So almost every site you see this day today, almost every blog you see, you have a like this on Facebook, you have a share this on Twitter, uh, you have a Pinterest, uh, you have Instagram, you have all these all these fun things. So you also saw the introduction of open source software. So instead of having an application where you can't really change what it is that you're using, people started coming out with this idea of let's put something out there that's already almost done and allow people access to it so they can build on top of it. And that, uh, that allowed for some of these great social uh, things that we're able to do today. Uh, some of the big ones, or probably the biggest one of all of these is probably WordPress, which at this point probably has 15% of all the sites on the internet are probably based on WordPress. It's, it's certainly the most popular platform on the web. And uh, people now have the ability to build plugins and add-ons on top of that and continue to customize it towards what they need. So moving into Web 3.0, um, I'll let Tim kind of discuss that, uh, that side of things. But essentially, what you start seeing with Web 3.0 in, in addition to these items is instead of a top-down approach where you have the publishers that are identifying what content they're going to release or the bottom-up approach where you have uh, people as a community identifying exactly what the content is on the web, you start to see this transition into more of a, a, a user approach. So I'm a user and I want to be able to know if I want to take my wife to a dinner and a movie and I have my, uh, I'm searching off my phone, mobile phone where they're able to track where I am, searching for where Google, where can I take my wife for dinner and a movie and being able to see results. And so, uh, Tim will talk a little bit about some of the technologies of Web 3.0. Uh, he'll talk about some of the design elements that you'll see, and uh, and then answer any questions. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, so yeah, Web 3.0 is not really a term that's used. So being asked to kind of speak on Web 3.0 is is fun because a lot of it's really speculative. Um, we're going to talk about a couple items here. We're going to talk about. Um, Structuring data, we're going to talk a, a lot about collecting data, um, getting data out, and then we're going to talk a little bit about design. Um, being an agency, we do a lot of design work. We get a lot of design questions. Um, a lot of the questions that we get right now are uh, around mobile, uh, how to have applications be more mobile friendly, uh, iPad friendly. Um, so, at any time, I know we're going to cover a wide range. Um, actually, let's do this. Um, how many people are more interested in learning how to display data in, in a better way? Anybody here? Uh, interested in the Sort of. One, two hands, three, four, five. <laughs> okay. Um, what about storing data? Anybody? Six. Six more? Okay. Um, anything else that anybody else is interested in uh, that might fit that gamut that we just talked about between getting managing data, et cetera? Okay. Um, if Web 1.0, which in the early stages of the web, if that was taking the Almanac and, and publishing it online so people could see the Almanac online, um, if Web 2.0 was farmers talking about that Almanac, 
for Scene Web 3.0 uh, being something where the farmers are monitoring each seed in their field. Um, there's just a huge amount of data that's out now. And being able to monitor each piece of data and get reported on that is really easy uh, these days, or easier, um, <coughs> I said. Um, a few years ago, it used to be that you had to have very unique or exotic hardware. There'd be these big servers that were you know, I mean, as wide as the screen and have huge air conditioners. They're really expensive, um, hard to maintain, and uh, had a short lifespan. Um, nowadays, you can get huge amount of uh, processing power that's basically um, a commodity and be able to store that data and process that data. Um, and we can even take that processing power, instead of having it in one location, and actually have that processing power be distributed uh, and be closer to the data so that processing can be faster. So some of the elements that we uh, summed up as what Web 3.0 meant for us was just having the avail availability of data um, and being able to get to that data fast and find correlations and also having a depth of data that's um, never been seen before. Okay, so let's talk about availability of data. Um, is anybody familiar with the term API? Okay, uh, RESTful API? Okay. So we do a lot of work with RESTful APIs. We love them. Uh, they're easy to consume. Uh, they work well and play well with other systems. Uh, what that stands for is Application Programming Interface. Um, what that allows you to do is to have an interface to your data where you can get certain things and really have it be very structured and, and organized. Um, <coughs> There are a lot of APIs available. Most software pieces or web software pieces, uh, salesforce.com, um, a lot of uh, analytics providers, uh, even for web analytics, Google analytics, all have APIs that are pretty easy to access. Um, nowadays, they're all following a uh, format of RESTful API. It's very easy to understand and, and get access to. Um, and we're seeing a lot of uh, historic data that's starting to accumulate. People are able to track more and able to store more data. Um, and the, that, excuse me, data is also becoming more device agnostic. Uh, we just did a project uh, where we were working with uh, a dashboard for a car. And so to help them design apps, figuring out how, how, how that uh, user is going to interface with it. And all the d data that's able to be collected from the car and transmitted back, as well as other applications being able to transmit to the car, uh, really cool. So being able to find uh, parking spots at, at a cheaper rate, or glimpse being able to track where you're at or your friends are at, uh, being able to find uh, cheaper gas prices or even reviews if you're looking for restaurants. Uh, speed of data. Uh, there are all sorts of tools out there now that allow processing data uh, to be very fast. So BigQuery is a product that Google released. Anybody familiar with this product? Okay, one person. <laughs> uh, this is a really cool product. It allows you to store a huge data set up to a billion rows um, and also <coughs> join that against another huge data set and to do it very quickly within a couple of seconds. And so um, it's, a, it's a great product. And so having that in the past, you'd have to run a batch job at night, export that data into maybe even another reporting database, and it would just take a long time and it's hard to, hard to get to. So that's a lot faster now. Uh, there are other systems out there, Storm uh, is a really fun one to, to use. Uh, it's open source by the Apache uh, project. And what it allows you to do is to uh, stream results. So as data is getting put into the data store, you can actually get results back at the same time. People are using that for 
monitoring uh, Twitter, things like that for certain events, um, or for security, being able to take a look at who's uh, accessing the site, um, or a lot of times it's used for analytics for companies that have a huge amount of traffic or looking for uh, pretty deep information. So used by companies like Groupon um, and Alibaba. Uh, we use a company called Copper A for our server monitoring. Uh, they provide real-time user information for, for the application on the application level. And it's something that's been great because it's been hard for us to collect that information in real time before, where we can correlate it to server load and other things that are going on as well. So it's great to be able to process data and a large amount of data at a higher speed. Um, depth of data, we talked a little bit about APIs running big joins using something like BigQuery. Um, but there's just a lot of information that's out there. Being able to drill down is something uh, that's been a little bit difficult to do in larger data sets. But being able to correlate more data. So um, how to get started? How do you get started using some of this technology? Uh, what we do a lot with clients is move a lot of the legacy systems over to a RESTful API approach. That way it can be uh, used in even some of the old uh, systems or being able to be incorporated into a new uh, user interface um, or new systems. Uh, start to uh, collect data, having historic data available, something that's been really uh, great for some of our clients, being able to correlate this year's results and compare to some of the details of last year's results. And um, setting up RESTful reporting, we talked about that. Um, design your user interface for lots of devices. We talked about uh, the car project that we did. But we're seeing a lot more mobile users for our sites, even some of the enterprise level stuff for reporting and, and viewing. And when possible, so you can set uh, a stream of your results. Uh, some of the API frameworks we use or like to use, um, one is called Express. Uh, this is uh, entirely written in JavaScript. It uh, works really fast. Um, and it's set up really well for uh, RESTful APIs. Another one is Sinatra. And it's based on a language called Ruby. It's uh, very easy to set up. Uh, runs very quickly. <coughs> and there's a good amount of information on them. Um, to get that information out, we use two systems uh, that are JavaScript based to actually get that information from um, RESTful APIs and either get it to a mobile device or to a screen. We use two frameworks one is Ember, and one is called Angular. What that allows you to do is bind information from, it's coming from the API and put it to the page so it doesn't require a page refresh when something changes. Um, you can also bind that to uh, a spot in the data store where updating that information and adding it um, is a lot easier. Great. A few other tools that we like. Uh, there's a new tool called socket.io. This allows you to uh, have real-time communication with with a user. So if you want to uh, collect information and have that in real time be pushed somewhere else. Uh, BigQuery is uh, a great tool to use. Um, Express.io is a combination of uh, Socket.io and Express that allows you to get something up and rolling really quickly. And for uh, user interface, we used uh, a library called Twitter Bootstrap, which has a whole bunch of pre-done UI elements, really easy to set something up really quickly. So, there we go. Um, tools for managing data, MongoDB is something that we use quite a lot of. Uh, 
uh, stores information in JavaScript. That allows us to have basically an entire application in JavaScript, which makes it a lot easier to manage. We're storing the data in JavaScript, using JavaScript to get it out, and then JavaScript to display it. Um, not only does it run fast, but it makes the people that you need to maintain it uh, a little bit easier to find. Great. Uh, any questions about data? I'm sorry? Is everything open source? Uh, sort of. BigQuery is a proprietary system. Um, it's based off something Google has called Dremel. Um, and it's a system that they set up to analyze analytics. And they have a lot of data. They deal with huge data sets really well. Uh, everything else is open source. All those frameworks um, are all open source. Bootstrap's open source. Um, Mongo and uh, Storm. And those are all open source projects. In the education field, we deal a lot with student data and uh, some of the regulations, especially in the US, are just ADA compliance, by way of compliance. I'm uh, wondering if you have anything to say regarding that. And you use a lot of tools that involve JavaScript. Do you have any challenges? How do you apply with the right way? Right, so that's a very good question. So, how many people are in the education here? Okay, so a lot. The question was, how do you deal with 508 compliance uh, with something like JavaScript? Um, and so, how many people know what 508 compliance is? Okay. 508 compliance is a government um, regulation that describes how web pages should be coded uh, for accessibility. And so, a lot of that deals with uh, disabilities, things like that, how screen readers. Um, <coughs> will process things uh, so that it can be accessed by a large group. And so one of the problems that JavaScript has uh, is that in the past it's been very difficult for information to be uh, seen by screen readers. It uh, was used what's called the client-side scripting, so it actually gets processed on the client's machine. And that didn't really work well with screen readers. And so a lot of times what we'll do is a fallback. Um, or if you know that something has to be 508 compliant, uh, trying to keep as much of that server side so that it can be put out. Um, but that's a very good question as far as dealing with sockets and real-time information. Um, some of that data, you could either um, um, write that directly to the DOM, probably server side, and just have refreshes that probably so probably be the best way to deal with that. Good, that's a that's a good one. Good to do more. Anybody have any other questions? So, okay. Uh, security is an issue. <coughs> right. Right. Yeah. That's a, that's a privacy is a big issue right, for security, and so. Um, Making sure that everything is secure in that fashion, having uh, authentication on your guys, and making sure that your data is stored in good uh, secure spots is important. Um, okay, so we're going to look through some of the UI elements that we'd like to use. Um, this is one that we like. We use quite a lot of it. It's called JQ Knob, <coughs> and it's really good for just displaying numbers. Um, and there's a couple different aspects of that. We use this a lot in dashboard design. Uh, here's an example of JQ um, <coughs> knob in a dashboard uh, from a system called Ghost. Ghost is a publishing platform that's a lot like WordPress. It's uh, built uh, with Node.js uh, JavaScript. Um, and it has a very clean interface. When we take a look at this compared to that past UI that Jordan showed a, that had just a shotgun, had every piece of information that you could ever need. We're seeing that we like to have fewer things on the page, more padding, but have the ability to drill down or see some, some of the results on there. Um, some of the things that have been popular too is if there's a graph, being able to put that behind a layer and kind of scale it back a little bit. That way you can get a good sense of how much of the historic data is in there, but really be able to show the quantitative data as well. And 
give, give you another example of a, a good clean dashboard, lots of room there. So if you don't have a development department to consume some of these or set up a user interface, uh, there's a company called Gecko Board that we actually have used internally that's really handy. Um, you can set up a basic dashboard in a few minutes. And they have a lot of support for various systems. Um, and it works very well, as well as being able to set up a custom uh, feed of your own. Great. So uh, we talked about JavaScript quite a bit. We use uh, jQuery uh, extensively. Uh, jQuery is a library that has a bunch of pre-written functions. Um, it's a little bit older than AngularJS and MemberJS and, and uh, a framework called Backbone. Uh, the latter three have a lot of support for dealing with data and APIs. And we'll, we're seeing that a lot of those, uh, there's a lot of good usage in those. Okay, so uh, recapping a little bit. Being able to uh, access a lot of data uh, on a multiple array of devices um, is something that we're seeing a lot more these days. Um, being able to query information from anywhere and having it be available uh, quickly. Getting deep results and allowing uh, for a very flexible and scalable system using the rest of the API. Any questions? Uh, so the question is, have we evaluated uh, D3? Uh, no, I'm not familiar with that. James, have you heard of D3? No. Say Java Supervisor is a big use for the data for some reason. Oh, okay. Not a lot of stuff that they Okay, yeah, I'm not doing Is it? Of course, they're going to play out. Okay. Okay. Sounds like Raphael. Sounds like Raphael. Is there any issues with like, cross domain scripting with some of these things? Yeah, absolutely. Anytime you have a RESTful API, you have to understand that it can be accessed from anywhere. And so locking those down uh, is very important. And so we see any time that you have, especially with JavaScript, uh, and the, the question is, cross-site scripting is uh, important to protect the kids, and absolutely. Um, we try to do a lot of URL filtering, if that makes sense. And so making sure that the request coming in, a lot of times we will have something out front of it. Um, to protect against it. We use Varnish, which is a caching server quite a bit. Um, and with Varnish, we can set up some rules to do uh, some filtering on the URLs that are coming, making sure that they're clean and they're from a source that's right. And then we'll set up a trusted source between Varnish server and the APIs. And what's nice about doing that too is if one of those, you can do health checks. Um, if one of your APIs is not responding fast enough, you can actually take it out of the mix um, until it comes back. So if something has a high load or goes down or is doing a restart, um, having a varnish setup as well will handle a lot of that maintenance for dealing with downtime a lot easier. And so there's other systems that are set up for that. There's uh, some uh, filtering that's available on the DNS level, uh, like Cloudflare is one. Uh, Cloudflare is pretty cool. They do a lot of scripting and have acceleration in their scripts. Um, and Encapsula is another one. I feel like Encapsula might actually catch a little bit more than Cloudflare. Um, but those are two useful tools as well. Great. Any other questions? Yeah, so if you use RESTful APIs to say putting back um, unit level data to a page, if somebody wants to do aggregates, how do you manage all of these call back uh, APIs? Do you have pre-aggregate uh, RESTful interfaces, or do you actually just keep the head? Like when you hit examine, 
Right. So the question is, how do we deal with traffic? Uh, if we have a lot of hits off of API, how do we deal with that on a certain page? Um, the way that I like to set that up is to really allow flexibility so that we can call something specifically. So getting the total <laughs> um, and being able to have those calls. If there's something that's a very heavy page, a lot of times we'll do that on the server and set a specific call for it so we get we have fewer calls, but that call returns a larger data array, if that makes sense. Um, but initially, once we set things up, we like to set it up so that you can call everything individually. And then if the load becomes too large, we like to cache uh, on reads as much as we can. Um, and that obviously doesn't work for streaming. <laughs> um, and then if there's something that we need to uh, take a look at as far as the load, we'll, we'll uh, create a very specific data set for a page. Any other questions? For performance-wise, yeah, is there any specific type of data that is better to be uh, called by REST API versus uh, you know, regular web, web protocol? So, you know, for example, like what I'm very uh, saying, uh, PDF files uh, versus some other, uh, because when I query, I just want to pull a bunch of this file. Does the REST API actually have better um, algorithm that would pull certain data set much more efficient versus the other? So we need to perform it because I'm um, working with certain set of data, I prefer I should avoid REST API versus. Right. So the question is, is there a certain data type that you should avoid using? Uh, or if there's one that's better to use for RESTful APIs? Um, and specifically mentioning uh, PDFs versus text. Um, yeah. We have a project where we have um, PDF generation, and that process takes a little while, can take a minute. Um, and so what we do in that case is set up a queue. I guess to answer your question, yes. <laughs> you want to keep your API snappy and fast. Um, if there's something that takes a while, if you have a larger load, things start to load up, you start to get timeouts, um, and then there's service uh, interruption. And so try to keep stuff as quickly responding as possible. Um, now, if you're dealing with uh, a large setter, you're having to stream binary data from a PDF or something like that, that can take a while. Um, we were working on a project where we were getting mortgage reports and comparison reports, and the data came back in a screen that was a couple megs, a pretty big set. It turned, you save that off, and it would be a 30-page PDF report. Um, we try to deal with those now using queue services, if that makes sense. So there's, um, if there's something that's going to take a while, we'll put it off in the queue. Uh, use a service like Rabbit and Q, and then uh, query that Q uh, to work off that, and it seems to work a lot better. And so sometimes you can't avoid it. Yeah, because we have an application that actually uh, spits out uh, a bunch of PDF cells and also more documents. Okay. And uh, so that's curious on that question. Right. Yeah. Sometimes, if you have a, if you're doing a long or a large write, um, it's going to take a little while. Um, yeah. How did you specific strategy when thinking about integrating third-party APIs together? Like, have you only done collect data from the database, and you kind of want to use Google Analytics API to see behavior on the side? Have you worked with anything like that? Uh, yeah, that's fun part. So the question is, uh, how do you take a third-party APIs and integrate it into something that you're working on? Um, like being able to also get uh, Google Analytics information. Um, and how do you architect that out? So there's two different ways. You can um, make a separate call out to that API. 
um, within your within your initial calls, or you can incorporate that API call into your API. What I like about that is you can if it returns uh, some type of error, you can gracefully handle it. Um, I guess you can the other way too, <laughs> but it seems a little bit easier. Um, and then if you need to make a secondary call out to another service, um, sometimes we deal with DNS or who has information, there's rate limiting, um, or even Twitter has uh, rate limiting. And so you might want to uh, go to a fallback method or even uh, a cache at that point. And so I'd like to incorporate those into um, kind of a front API, if that makes sense, and we can cascade it. Uh, so the question is, how do you deal with uh, large payloads from the RESTful API as far as receiving <coughs> um, Good question. Lazy loads work really well. Uh, how, how large are you talking about? Um, a medic. <coughs> Yeah, in some instances, if you're done with mobile or if you have a lot of data that's transferring, that can load up. Um, so lazy loads are, are great. That's a good question. Um, and it's really going to be dependent on the audience and who's consuming that. So, good questions. D3, I'm going to have fun tonight. Um, any other questions? I want to work with you guys. You can do jobs. How do you set up rate limiting? Probably if, if a service is consuming it uh, too rapidly. Uh, okay, so how do you set up rate limiting or throttling for an API? <clears throat> so that's a very good question. A lot of times where we deal with that is if, is if a spider or bot starts to hit it. Um, there's a couple different ways that you can, or a few different ways that you can set that up. It's going to be dependent on how quickly you need to access that information. Um, so some people save that in RAM, depending on how long that timeout is, um, for how many people can access that. Um, I've heard of some people even using Storm, uh, setting information into a queue and then using Storm to analyze a large set of data if they have a lot of traffic. Um, if you have something that's not high traffic and you just want to set it per day, uh, we've even released it up to like a SQL Lite uh, database or something that's file based. It will be a little bit, might be a little bit faster than something that's relational or even to a relational database. So um, something like that isn't going to have a huge, well, it's going to get hit a lot, <laughs> but you're just doing simple increments, so it shouldn't have that big of a load. Um, but what we'll do is we'll set up a function that handles all that so it's really easy. It's called on every every API and uh, and integrated. Does that answer your question? I think you were referring to logging. I'm asking if you want to rate limit it. Say you have a client with a certain IP that's trying to saturate the API, just throttling down the, the request from that particular client so that other clients can get access to it. Okay, so uh, got you. That makes sense. So if there's a client that's accessing a lot of that information from a certain IP address, and storing those up or uh, limiting that so that other people can have fast access to it. Um, in that scenario, we'd probably do it the same way and just uh, set up it, set up blocks. Um, so if it hits that rate limit, we will just return a, uh, like a 503 or some type of code to let them know that it's they hit their limit. Actually, I think it was a, a, I am going to add on to question. I think what, what he's asking for uh, is that, is there a way that you would be able to limit the API call per IP? So for that API call that of a, uh, a person can make, um, it would be limited to X amount of call per IP so that one IP cannot overload that Single call, right? If I understood that correctly, I actually, uh, I am actually interested in that. Okay. If he's not asking that question, I would be interested in that question. Is that correct? So, by IP, limiting by IP address, by how many? Because ISAP has a open source version of what we use. Just 
I sat through the whole damn spider and the box and stuff. Oh, so check out that. So we're not even going to be there since all the time. Right, right. Okay. Right. And there are certain things that you can do depending on which web server you're using, like SAPI, um, or even using HG access if you're using uh, some type of Apache or something on the front of it. Um, but a lot of times we would keep some type of key value pair where we have that key address and then the value would be how many hits they've had for a certain period of time. And then we'll um, be able to essentially reset that every so often. Great, any other questions? Great, well thank you guys very much. I really appreciate it.